other questions that people have sent in that I want to go over before I open it up for questions? Question that we common get, commonly get is timing of supplements. There are certain supplements that I recommend that does require specific timing, meaning that you want to take them at a specific time of day or at a specific time of the day around what you're doing as far as food intake, meaning that some supplements it's okay to take with food, some supplements you want to take on an empty stomach. Some supplements you want to take a couple of hours after, other supplements, some supplements you want to take right in the morning, some you want to take at night before you go to bed, some you want to take on an empty stomach. So that does get very confusing. But if I've recommended a supplement to you and I haven't given you any data about you have, want to take this on an empty stomach, or this is a homeopath, so you're taking this away from any time you have mint in your mouth, or this is a di this is an enzyme that we're using to help digest your cancer, so we want to take this on a um, away from food from about from about an hour away from food, or this is a supplement we're trying to get your liver to flush in a phase two point five phase three purpose, so we want to take this after the bitters supplement. If I didn't give you that data, then it doesn't matter when you take the supplement. So just so you know, if I didn't give you specific data on when you should take a supplement, then it really doesn't matter whether you take the supplement with food or not. Most of the supplements that we use are food-based supplements. So does it matter if you take it with food or not? Not really. Not really. So is it sometimes better to take them outside of food so you don't quote unquote water down the supplement? Maybe, but everybody's different. Sometimes people take supplements on an empty stomach that are good food-based supplements, so it shouldn't make any difference if they take them on an empty stomach, but they get a tummy ache from them. So you're gonna have to try that yourself. Not everybody is the same. So uh, if I didn't give you specific data on when to take it, you could take it any time of the day. Facebook rules. We're getting a lot more people, a lot more patients on our Facebook page, which is wonderful. We do have some rules. Now, I'm not stating these rules because anybody's broken any rules because they haven't. Matter of fact, I think Tashita posted something. She said, I'm not sure if this is right to post this. It was about another uh, individual that has cancer that she knows and um, that's fine to post things like that, that you want somebody, you know, we're a family. And if we want to be praying for someone, that's really great. Do remember, though, this Facebook page is primarily for our patients. So though I appreciate it if you post something like that, or I appreciate it if you post maybe a question about your loved one or about your child, understand that's not really what this is for. So the Facebook page is for those who paid for a full plan. So that's really what the purpose of it's for. So try to keep to your personal questions and your personal um, uh, things that would inspire others on the board and think of it that way. We don't want it just to become a random Facebook page either. So I'm not saying anything bad about anything that was posted up to this point in time. We just want to keep in mind that that piece, that, it, that um, it's for all of our patients. Uh, Facebook questions. This is, again, the Facebook page is for you to ask questions. So, and I purposely created it for there to be interaction. I want you to be answering each other's questions. And we see that all the time. What a blessing it is. So everybody's answering other people's questions. And I do notice that um, like on the essential oils question, some people are very educated. They've been doing essential oils for a lot of long time. Mike is one of those people and he's posting things on the essential oil page, some different um, different ideas on what a person could do. And then he always puts in there very um, um, you know, professionally, please check with Dr. Connors about this for you, uh, and I thank you for that. That should just be a, 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 a without saying. We're not advocating, nor can the clinic advocate anything, any 
everybody else is doing, even a recipe that they're using, it might not be valid for you. Make sure that you're checking your binder that a recipe that somebody else posts is not necessarily something you could eat. Everybody's on a different diet. Uh, an essential oil that might be great for one person might not be great for another person. So I don't want you as patients to not give your great insight to other people, but I also don't want you to have to type in a little caveat that please ask Dr. Connors first. That should just be that should just be a given. So I want you to give your knowledge to other people, but I also want that other person who's reading it to, to know enough, to have enough common sense to know that, boy, if maybe this isn't what I should do, and to ask me and my opinion, and to make sure you look at the, the rules that we gave you with your diet to see if it fits as well. Uh, and then our DNA kit is in. So we know that a lot of people did the 23andMe, and remember, our software changed, so we could read the 23andMe data. So if you already did the 23andMe, you do not need to do our new DNA kit. But our new, if you have not done the 23andMe yet, then we want you to do our DNA kit. So contact our office if you have not done the 23andMe and you're ready to do a DNA kit and we want to get that done. Now that DNA kit is to measure SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those are genetic defects or genetic variants that we want to look at that have to do with cancer genes, that's what we're talking about with, in my book here. Different things in your genes that can can be a piece of the cause of your cancer and can be the piece of the cure for your cancer. So we want to get everybody's genetics run. So if you haven't had your genetics either, 23andMe or our kit, make sure you contact our office so we can get a kit out to you. Now I know Jen has called multiple people, everybody on the list, and quite honestly, did not hear back from the vast majority of those people she left messages with. So if you're on this call and you have not had your DNA run, it's time to do that. Get a hold of the office so we can get a kit out to you. And then lastly, we had a number of IVG tests coming back in, people doing it for their second, third, and even fourth time, and we're starting to see these trends. Now, that's where the beauty of the IVG comes in. It's one thing to get an IVG score, and great, I have a score of 32. Well, I don't know what my score was before, so how am I trending up or am I trending down? How is this going? I just don't don't know. But when you start to get your second and your third test back, and if we're trending up, then we need to do some tweaking of what we're doing. If we're trending down, then we are on the right track and we're doing the right things. Even though you might still be struggling with a lot of things, we know that the cancer is starting to arrest. So remember what the IV gene is measuring. The IV gene is completely different than the DNA kit, even though this is a DNA test. So the DNA kit, or the 23andMe, or our DNA kit, is measuring genetic defects or variants on different genes. The IV gene test is measuring free cell DNA, means circulating cells. It's measuring circulating tumor cells. And on those circulating tumor cells, it's measuring is the, are the oncogenes, those are the genes that stimulate cancer growth, are they turned on? And are the tumor suppressor genes, those are the genes that suppress a tumor, that turn off a cancer, that slow a cancer. Are they turned on or off? So the higher the IV gene score, that means the more of your oncogenes are turned on and the fewer suppressor genes are turned on. And the lower the score, the more oncogenes are turned off and the tumor suppressor genes are turned on. So we want the tumor suppressor genes to be upregulated, to be turned on. We want the tumor oncogenes to be downregulated or turned off. 
that has to do whether they're methylated or not. So not to get too technical, we want a lower score. So we want our score to trend down. So if it's trending up, we need to tweak some things. Now, plus or minus five, six, eight points, not too worried about that. It can bounce around a little bit, depending upon your stress levels, depending upon your diet, depending upon what you're doing as far as nutrition goes, other things that are going on in your life, stimulation of your immune system, suppression of your immune system. These are all things that can cause cancer to grow or could cause cancer to slow. So as we look at this over multiple tests, we want to look at the trend. So we had another question just come in, random question. Is there anything unhealthy about popcorn if made on a stove with coconut oil? Great question. Is popcorn good for you or bad for you? Well, number one, is it organic popcorn or is it regular popcorn? If it's regular popcorn, it's going to be genetically modified corn. So there is zero good things for you in genetically modified corn. So period. Oh, no, it's organic popcorn with coconut oil. Well, that's good then, right? Well, corn is a grain. Remember, it's not a vegetable. Corn is a grain. It's not a vegetable. So it's simply carbohydrates. Is there any value in eating corn? Uh, no. Matter of fact, corn can also be a highly sensitive thing, meaning there's a, a, a probably the most um, food sensitive thing that, I mean, most common food sensitivity is gluten, dairy, soy, and corn. Maybe I could think of a few other things. So is there any value in corn? Is there anything, but the question was, is there anything unhealthy about eating, let's put in, organic popcorn if made on a stovetop with, with coconut oil? No, if that could be your snack and that's going to be your little snack for the day, then go for it. I don't want to knock it um, because that could be we're searching for something to eat here, right? But don't call it something that's good for you. So this is going to be your cheat snack. You're going to have a little popcorn with some sea salt, and it's organic, and you made it with coconut oil, so you're getting a good fat with it. So there's nothing really wrong with it. Just make sure you don't have any sensitivity issues to corn. Um, how would I know that? Well, you can run a test. There's some different blood tests that we can do if you really want to know if you have any corn sensitivities, if you have any... Um, any um, uh, antibodies to corn uh, and corn, um, different proteins in corn. Uh, but you can also notice, do I get a tummy ache after I eat it? Does it bother me? Do I get a headache? Do I get stuffy after it? So you can notice if I have any symptoms after eating corn as well. But otherwise, no, go ahead and have that. Understand it's a carbohydrate. It's not a protein. It's not a vegetable.